Anybody know what that is? Yeah, that's Magoo. That's Magoo point right there. Okay, so when I started, so I'm going to start with a couple examples of some of the restorations that I've worked on. Um, my background was from when I went to college, I wanted to be a reporter. I didn't like science. And I thought, I mean, I, did, I always kind of thought science was interesting, but I thought scientists were really, really lame. But they're very boring and dispassionate and not fun to talk to and kind of weird. Um, thank God I'm not like that. <laughs> and, uh, and so, um, anyway, so, so I, through a series of things that happened that if you guys are curious, we can talk about, but, but basically I um, got tricked, one of my mentors, two of my mentors tricked me into taking um, a sort of hard biology class, a genetics class, and I did really well. I'm like, oh, this is cool. Like, maybe I kind of like this. And they're like, haha, see, we knew it. And, um, <laughs> and so the next class I took was taught by this really famous guy named Joe Connell who's a, an ecology professor, the father of modern quantitative ecology. He's the guy that first started bringing essentially statistics to, to, e to ecology. Um, uh, Bob Payne just passed away, another famous ecologist just passed away uh, a few months ago. And he was the guy that, um, for example, invented keystone, the notion of keystone predators and keystone species. He did that with no replication. He just kind of made his observation, wrote a paper. So back in the day, he didn't need statistics. <laughs> he could just say, hey, and turns out he was right, so it was awesome. But, but Joe Connell was the father that started bringing replication and all this and that to the story. And so he taught essentially introductory bio, or, or the introductory bio part that dealt with ecology. And I took it, and one of the things he talked about was ecological restoration. And I said, wow, this is it, dude. This is what I want to do. I said, awesome. And so, um, in the middle of our last lecture, all the grad students ran in and gave him balloons because it, it was his last class he was ever teaching. He was retiring. Um, and so, oh, bum. So I went up to talk to him and said, hey, man, so it's not like you're, you're – I mean, he didn't stop doing research. But, you know, I said, like, oh, so, hey, so who does ecological restoration here? Nobody. I was an undergrad at UC Santa Barbara. Nobody at the time was doing anything like that. That, that was considered very, you know, not, not, not sexy, not interesting, not a, not, not a desirous career path if you wanted to be, you know, famous and, and, a, and a top flight person. And so I was like, oh, bummer. So then I ended up knocking on all these people's doors for, for many, many, many people and, and ended up doing um, underwater scuba stuff, which was great too. But, but I, I, my initial interest was restoration ecology and it took me a while to get back to that. A lot of great experiences, but, but there weren't a lot of people out there that I could go talk to. And so one of the first, set, first experiments that I did, it wasn't, I wasn't intending it to be a restoration experiment, but it was really a manipulation experiment, but it, it has implications, was this thing. So this is part of my PhD work, and this is out at Catalina Island. This is in the volleyball courts. Uh, and what those things are are giant tarps that I built. Um, I was doing an experiment, not necessarily related to restoration, but but... I was curious as to how light influenced these little baby alga individuals that were landing on rocks. And I, was, and I did all this crazy stuff, and then, you know, we have to have uh, carbonated beverages of our choice for me to explain all the travails that happened to me during my, during my PhD. But, but suffice it to say, the things broke a lot, and I, I was very frustrated. So I decided these little things I was building that wouldn't, wouldn't work, I needed something bigger. So I made these things. And everybody thought they looked like trampolines. And there, these are, this is a, a series of things. So the ones on the bottom are solid canvas, like a, like a, a sail on a, on a sailboat, so that um, light couldn't go through, or, 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 very, or basically no light could go through. Then the ones up in the middle are obviously just a frame, so that's just a control, a procedural control, and so that allows all the light to go through. And then the ones on the top are like a really, really dense mesh that you might see at the back of a batting cage. So. Um, would allow about 50% of the light, of the sunlight through. And so then I had this great idea to go put these underwater, like 30 feet, 20, 30 feet underwater, and then look at what happened. And I almost killed everybody doing these things. It was very hard. But this is what they look like when you got them out underneath. So those little black cages are actually the main experiment I, was, I designed this to, to do. And those are things making snails be allowed to go on the area or making them being excluded from an area. But with, but that's not the purpose of our talk today. The purpose of our talk is the stuff above it. So if you look above it, you see there's all these fish. Tons and tons and tons of fish. And there's no difference 
uh, I mean, there's a little bit of a current difference, but there's no real difference between where those fish are now and what it looked like a few weeks before I put this down, right? All the rocks around it are the same. All the, the depth of the water is the same. The proximity to the land is the same, all this and that. The only thing, uh, well, the main thing I changed is the light. And as soon as I changed that one aspect of the uh, environment, whoosh, these fish totally um, responded. And so then that sent me down some, doing some experiments with, I made fake, fake uh, giant kelp stalks and, and did all those kind of things. The short version is, all that stuff didn't matter. It was the light. The fish were absolutely queuing on the light. And not only were they queuing on the light, they were queuing in on the amount of the light. So depending on how much light, a, if it was really dark, a big honking fish would come in. If it was a little bit uh, you know, dark, some more baby fish would come in. And, and there were all these different, these different size segregations. So it was really cool. So showing that a small manipulation of the physical environment can lead to really different distributions of species. So in this case, if we wanted to have more fish in an area, let's say to protect them from fishermen or something like that, we could do something like this and you can get a result. So that's really cool. Now, this is what, what I was basically doing here is these fish that were all over the reef. I was saying, dude, this is a cool place. Come hang out here. So I really did change the distribution of critters on this reef, but I didn't make more fish, right? They just, they just changed how they, were, how they were distributing themselves on, on the reef. So I didn't make any more fish mass, at least over the short term of this kind of thing. So, so restoration can encompass that kind of stuff, can encompass our attempts to, to make more of certain things or make more of certain things in a certain place, or in some cases, make less of certain things like a non-desirous invasive species. Um, I, and then I did a lot of work at Magoo Lagoon during my PhD, which this was not my PhD focus. My PhD focus was all underwater, but this was sort of like a second PhD thing I did. Um, and in this case, we'll talk more about this later, but in this case, um, this is an area that was not salt marsh, in the middle of the salt marsh that was de degraded and damaged, and we'll talk about that story when we get to it. But essentially, we came on in and we did what you might call a classic restoration. We changed the physical environment, and here we got plants to come on in. We actually jump-started that by, by ourselves planting a bunch of little plants, and that was, that was uh, several years before I took this picture, and now the plants have grown, and it looks like out in front of us, it looks just like a salt marsh, that was all something that we built and designed, all the stuff, just about everything you see in, in um, the, the foreground here, at least. Um, in this case, though, we didn't just do the experiment. We didn't just sort of drive stuff around. It's all super, super precisely measured and all replicated so that we can actually know as the restoration progresses, did this work or did that work? Right? So rather than just doing something and, and walking away, we could actually tell the things that were most effective, that would be most cost effective and also most ecologically beneficial uh, for the next phase or the next restoration. And that's a key thing because a lot of times people don't do that. They don't take careful measurement and um, that has to do with the fact that uh, most of our restoration efforts do not take place in academia. Again, that legacy we talked about that, that historically academia has viewed restoration ecology as beneath them, is not something they should be dealing with. So as a consequence, most of the projects that are done across the world are done by consulting firms, and they, not necessarily bad people, but they don't have the luxury or the resources to spend several years monitoring. They have to do the legally required amount of monitoring, and they leave, they stop. So a lot of times we don't know exactly why something failed or why something succeeded. In this case, we do. So that's a salt marsh restoration. Here's another type of restoration. This is one, uh, uh, so my postdoc, my, I did a postdoc up at Stanford on ecological restoration. And at the time it was the, I, well, it was one of the first ones that I ever heard of and everybody I talked to ever heard of. So I'm sure there was others somewhere else in Kansas or something, but, but these are very, very rare to be a postdoc in restoration ecology. And so um, in this case, we did all kinds of cool stuff that we also will talk about um, later on in the semester. But this is a grassland on the main campus of Stanford University. You can see their version of the bell tower right there called Hoover Tower in the middle of the, of the uh, upper part of that photo. And what we're essentially doing here is we're trying to make more wetland. We like to make more wetland, but in this case, 
we're trying to make more wetland specifically to encourage the populations of this endangered critter. In this case, it was a um, salamander that, that uh, and as an amphibian, these guys depend on water for the reproduction. So they don't have to have water day to day, but to lay their eggs, they need water. And so this was uh, an attempt to, to respond to this declining population. And so we were, we were uh, changing boulders and changing logs and excavating and doing the classic thing. You know, very man, a lot of restoration of storage is very manly. A lot of guys, guys that spit and they drive like big machinery and they like to swear. I've learned all kinds of great swear words when I was working with these guys. And so, so it's a very macho thing. It's, it's increasingly become um, less macho, and, and, which is a good thing. But, but you know, historically, this is what it was, driving tractors around and spitting and going having some beers, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, and so in this case, you need that stuff because these boulders are, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds each. And you're moving lots of them. We're taking whole trees down. So we're using the, the, the techniques from con the construction industry oftentimes. But instead of trying to make a house or a building, we're trying to manipulate the landscape into to taking a certain form. Uh, and then this is, uh, this, that's Onde, uh, that's my uh, uh, friend, one of my many friends in Turkey. And this is a, a project that I started when I came here. So this project is actually in Eastern Turkey. And um, this is a, uh, a whole bunch of things we can say about this. We'll also talk about this later. But this is, a, in this case, the area around a lake. And this is an area um, almost into, uh, this is along the, the area where we work is from the uh, Black Sea, so the Georgian border to uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, down through to the Iranian border. Um, so this is in a, uh, near, in a province called Kars, and this is um, uh, a, pro a lake that's surrounded by three villages. This is all subsistence living. So th these are folks, these are not wealthy folks, these are folks that are growing wheat and or have some animals for dairy, and that's pretty much it. And so they are uh, uh, challenged in terms of a lot of things. And this is also, uh, this is the only project I've ever done that's basically high mountains. So this is, this is steps, Russian steps. This is high elevation, grasslands, uh, cold in the winter kind of thing, lots of snow. But in this case, we're trying to get this, you can have a look at this, this looks kind of a little bit crappy, uh, or it looks like a golf course. It depends on your perspective. Um, but if you look down at our feet, the grass is super small, right? It looks like it's been mowed. It has been mowed. There's just so many gosh darn ungulates. There's so many grazes around. They graze every single possible thing you can see. So there's cattle, there are sheep, there's hor there are horse, there's all kinds of stuff. Um, and so, everything gets grazed. And so in this case, this restoration wasn't so much about doing a lot of stuff. It was rather about taking something away. In this case, it was trying to take the grazing pressure away. So if we, if we don't allow the um, animals to graze every single gosh darn square inch, hey, maybe will we get more? And so you see here, uh, in, so I'm inside the cage, on there is, is out in front of the cage. Um, but this was our attempt to screen out grazers. Just like I had with my little snails out of Catalina, put a screen and keep the, keep the grazers out. This is the same thing, but with bigger critters. And so the idea here is, as you go into the distance, the, you're going into the lake and it's getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And at some point, the, the critters aren't gonna, the animals aren't gonna wanna walk into the water. So this is a three-sided fence. So it's open to the outside. Also, we're trying to grow ducks and things like that. So we wanted it to be open so that the ducks, because ducks, that's kind of stupid, right? They can't, they can't just fly. They kind of have to like whoo, run. And when they land, they kind of whoo, they come into land. So they're not like a hummingbird. They can't go whoo, we just go up and down. So, so we, we needed to create a runway so that if ducks wanted to come nest or leave from the nest, they could do that more easily. Um, and so we'll talk about what happened with this experiment. Um, but again, the idea was, hey, if we don't have things munching every single square inch, will we get actual vegetation start to grow? And when that vegetation starts to grow, that's better habitat for the birds. And then we're restoring bird populations, boosting the diversity or the number of birds, as well as the plants. And if we're doing that, oh, I don't know, maybe we're boosting the, um, the, the tourism potential of this. And maybe these people, that are, these bird nerds, will come and pay the villagers to stay in their village, right? pay them directly. 
there's, there's a lot of, we have a lot of problems in many parts of the world like Turkey with graft and, and issues where, uh, you know, you work for my cousin who works for my nephew who works for my da, 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 da. And so the folks on the ground floor of the resource oftentimes do not get the resources or the money. So this was an effort to try to have money go directly to the people that live there. And then they see a clear economic signal. Hey, if we have more, more reeds, more vegetation, pfft, that's good. I get paid more, right? So to try to do all that kind of stuff, and we'll talk about um, what has happened there. But all different examples of how using, of how restoration really is uh, useful and draws from both theory and also informs theory and our understandings of how these systems interact with each other. Cool? Make sense? All right, cool. In general, when we talk about this notion of environmental science or this notion of applied ecology or however we want to phrase it, I think it's best to think of it in three different parts. And uh, I came up with this when I was uh, super not feeling well um, and I had to give a presentation that I, I had thought I would, didn't have to. I thought my professor forgot about it and then he said, hey, Sean, why don't you go up there and give this thing? And I, uh, so this was sort of so sort of an inspiration from talking with some people right before I walked on to give this presentation. But, but uh, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't my thing. I just sort of uh, clarified some things. And people have said this for a long time. But the, the short version is, what do we do here? The first thing we do is we say, hey, is there a problem here? Right? Is there a problem with this oil spill? Is there a problem with this, I don't know, energy consumption? Is there a problem with whatever? So the first thing we do is measure stuff and actually find out if there's even anything to worry about in the first place. That's a key step. The next step is if there's no problem, we're good to go. We're done, right? Go on to the next thing. But if there is a problem, next the question is how do we stop the stress? How do we stop the badness from happening, right? How do we cap that oil well? How do we, you know, how do we stop the number of new invasive individuals coming in, right? Also a non-trivial thing and a key step. But that's oftentimes where folks end. So sometimes people end at step one, which is just, is there a problem? Sometimes people end at step two. Restoration is about, I mean, it involves all those, but it's really about step number three. So restoration ecology is if we've identified a problem and we've you know, kind of figured out how we can stop it, and, and we've stopped the initial main badness, right, the oil flowing onto the beach, then how do we fix it? How do we turn back? And that's why I like restoration so much. That's why I've always liked restoration, because it's not passive, right? It's not some a-hole presidential candidate telling you what your choices are. It's you deciding, I want to be empowered, and I want to move the ball forward. I just don't want to say, oh, well, this thing's screwed. We'll have to wait like 300 years. It's actually saying, you know what? Hey, maybe we can do something to get this orangutan, to get this butterfly, to get this whatever back here now. And so I find it a very empowering thing. And it's an, it's an active thing to do. And it's a response to some of the non-desirous things we've done in the past, either intentionally or unintentionally. And so that's why I enjoy it so much. And that's why I think it's a key thing. And that's why I think it's so important you guys at least know conceptually about it and how to deal with it. Cool? Okay, good. So we're about, restoration is about how we erase that impact, uh, however we define that impact. Questions so far? Okay. So the rest of what I have lined up here, um, we, might, we might sort of pause this and... Uh, and get back to this uh, next week, depending on, on how we're feeling here. But, um, but let's get a little interactive, because we get, we've been way too quiet here. I've been doing way too much of the talking today so far. So um, let me ask you guys, what do you think? How would you guys, I just gave you a conceptual idea of restoration ecology. How would you guys define restoration ecology? Or, or what might be a classic restoration, uh, uh, ecological restoration? And so how about you guys say your name first so we can, we can meet everybody's name. I should have had everybody introduce ourselves. Shoot. Okay. <laughs> Let's stop right now before Andy says anything. So I'm obviously Dr. Anderson, which I guess I didn't introduce myself. How lame is that? Sorry about that. <laughs> so uh, uh, professor of ESRM. Awesome. Mary Beth. 
And, and stand up so we can all see you. Okay, let's get some light on this. We tell say, hey, Mary. Hey. Hi, Mary. Hi. 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 Yes, ma'am? Yes. Okay, cool. All right, good. Welcome, welcome. Hi, everyone. My name is Amy, and I'm also. Wait, wait, wait. Hey, Amy. Hey. 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 Basically, like ESRM. But I have an emphasis in ecology. Right, 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 right. No, no, I didn't mean, I didn't, I didn't mean a bad thing. I just meant, I just meant uh, I'm used to not having a lot of ESRM people in this, in this class. That's cool. All right, great. So, anyway, so thanks for doing that. And uh, if you guys could, for the first you know, week or so, you guys might know each other, but I don't know everyone here, and so maybe we don't all know each other. So, for the first week or so, if you guys could just chime in with your name before you comment, that'll help us all get everybody's name. So, Andy was going to say, and who's going to say something about restoration ecology? Um, I guess what I think about is restoring or I guess preparing a landscape back to its like uh, native state or natural state. Okay, so some notion of back in time or something? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so we got back in time? Um, well, you got to say who you are. I'm preparing ecosystems. Okay, so this notion of... So we have the notion of back in time. Oops. We have the notion of repair. Cool. Good. Hayden. Uh, or, sorry. Mine sorry. Is Hayden. Yeah. And bringing, like, protecting an animal or trying to repopulate. Okay, repopulation. I like that one. That's good. Okay, good. Okay, so so far we have this notion of back in time. This notion of of repairing something that presumably was broken. And this notion of uh, increasing the number of things that were presumably at a lower number. Oh, my name's Kevin, and like improving. Okay, improving. So something is, uh, so that to me says that maybe something isn't totally effed up, but it's not ideal, right? So, okay, good. It's the notion of, of, of increasing on some axis, some performance. Uh, Jamie, and you're going to remove the invasive species. Okay, so, so no invaders. Okay, no invaders. Good, cool. Anybody else have any initial ideas about what we think of or, or, or what comes to mind when we talk about ecological restoration? Um, Jayla, making a certain area or ecosystem more ideal than what we think is. Ooh, interesting better. term, ideal. Interesting. So, so talk a little bit more about that. When you say ideal, what do you. So sometimes we think, like, oh, things were so much better back in time. Like right. This Good. That's good. Yeah. So one of my um, that's pet peeve. That's not right. But one of the things I obsess over, maybe obsess over is a way to say it, uh, is uh, this this whole notion of 
of history. And some people are really strong historical advocates. And, 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 and maybe they do know, maybe they do know what it used to be. Maybe we have some great pictures and some whatever maps or something. Um, but they like, that's the thing. Restoration is going back to this thing in 1929 or something. And sometimes that's totally cool. And other times that maybe doesn't have any relevance, right? Like with our rainfall patterns right now, if we're trying to restore the critters that were, the plants that were right here in 1929, maybe we get them to grow for a little while, but uh, probably not gonna do super great. It might be better to say grab some plants that were more down like South Orange County or something like that, Northern San Diego County, maybe plant those guys here. Those guys might, might have a chance of doing better something like that but this notion of what is ideal what is the goal we'll, we'll spend uh, time talking about that good other thoughts or other ideas about yeah uh, rebalancing like bringing the wolf back to Ooh, balance story. good this is something i've thought long and hard about i've been thinking about writing a paper about this but 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 um very deeply ingrained idea this notion of the balance of nature that there's sort of this this uh uh like a homeostasis thing in chemistry class where we have everything is just sort of equaled out, um, very deeply ingrained in our thinking. It's unclear if that is actually the case in nature, if things are all always just changing, maybe just faster or slower, but it's a very key point and we definitely need to talk about that. So that notion of balance, we don't want to have too much of A and less of B or something, that's good, that's good. Who else, somebody else had their hand up? Oh, Andy? Um, like Wait, you gotta say your name! Andy? Yeah, I see. Uh, like maybe setting up baselines occasionally? Uh, talk, what do you mean by that? Talk a little bit more when you say baselines. Um, well, not to get into like a back in time thing, but like you want to set the baseline to what you want the site to eventually see, I guess. Maybe like you knew what this was at one point or something. So like a goal. Baseline. Yeah. Maybe a goal. Okay. Okay. Cool. So what are we working towards? Good. Yeah, we'll talk about that too. Good. Other thoughts, other ideas about what we mean by ecological restoration at the mile high level. Yeah. Amanda, I'm not too sure, but I think of like communication and interaction. So. Are you talking about human communications? Um, communication. Okay. Okay. So um, I'll put communications. What I would say. Uh, we'll talk about it in a second, but um, this notion of function is another way to say that, ecological function, so that, so that this community is functioning well, so that this, this frog can call its mate, and the predator can hear its prey, and all that, all, whatever, all that kind of communication stuff, but really a functioning ecosystem, right? It allows all these things, energy, um, uh, materials to move through the system and do all that good stuff. Good. I like it. I like it. Anything else? <laughs> okay, good. Okay, that's, that's a good start. Okay, there we go. So good. So to recap, we have this idea of, of what, is, what is restoration ecology, at least sort of our heads to start with. We have this notion of um, uh, re reducing or eliminating the number of invasive species, non-desirable species, there's this notion of, of somehow back in time has some kind of guidance for us or there's, we need to think back in time. This notion of repairing something that's broken and non-functioning. This notion of repopulation, which is this notion of going from a low number to a higher number, presumably. Uh, in your guys' term improve, similar to that, right? This notion of going from one level to a higher level. Um, ideal, uh, ideal and goal. Those two words may be, may be linked about you know, where, where are we trying to build towards. The one that's the idea that there is, we do know what the, absolute, the answer should be. And the other is, uh, you know, how, do we, how do we get to that, to that location? So having clear goals or having an, an ideal in our head or, or explicitly stated in our plan. Some notion of balance was another idea you guys had, which is, again, this notion of um, uh, sort of a give and take, and we can't have all of one thing. We have to have some kind of uh, mix of things. And then this notion of uh, functional communication, functioning ecosystems. Great. Good start. Good start. We're going to have a good class. I can tell. That's awesome. That's awesome. 
So let's start with um, a little more thinking about a lot of what you guys just talked about. Let me kill these lights for a second. Okay, so let's talk about, um, before we come up with the definition, how do we use restoration? How might we use restoration? What might we do? So this notion you guys just said of historic or past or guidance, so um, these are all, all these examples I'm going to show you are all real examples, they're not made up. They're all um, from projects I've done or, or, or projects other people have done. So here we are, we're looking at us, right? We're up a little bit to the right, on, just, just off to the right of this image, but this is the Oxnard Plain. Um, Magoo Lagoon and Point Magoo are at the bottom right of this photo, and then as we go on up, there's, you see the sprawling metroplex that is Oxnard. We're looking at the Oxnard Plain here. And... Uh, and the picture is from now or a few years ago. And the red is an old navigation chart that's overlain on top of this. So the red is um, a survey that showed the extent of wetlands. Most of these surveys were done from boats. In this particular case, it probably happened that the surveyor wa walked up onto, point, uh, onto Magoo Mountain just because it was a vantage point. But but the idea is really focus on the coast. So these guys weren't focused inland. Again, a navigational chart. But if you just do a simple grab of that chart and overlay it onto our modern you know, Google map or a modern image or whatever, the red is wetland. The red is historic wetland. So knowing nothing else, we know that back in the day, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, that was where the wetlands were. They, Maybe even more, probably more extensive than that, but at a minimum, they were at least this area. And now we have fields, we have houses, we have all this stuff. So one thing you can talk about restoration is just we were at one level, we're not there now. We're going to use this tool of ecological restoration to get back to that level, right? So that's one thing people do. Um, uh, it's a challenge, though. So in this case, we'll talk more about Ormond uh, later, but um, if this is all we're doing, if all we're doing is saying, hey, here's where the wetlands are, let's put wetlands right where this red is, right? One, that would be awesome, actually, if we had that kind of money, I'd, I'd, I'd go for that. <laughs> but, but setting that aside, for, setting the logistics aside for a second, let's just say we did that. Is that gonna work? Actually, it's not, right? So this is, this is um, part of our, part. So this is some of the land that is now owned either by the state or by, by TNC and, and, and uh, the, the folks that are trying to restore this salt marsh. And what this is showing is the elevation of these different areas. And so what you see is blue is below, uh, basically below high tide. As we go forward, the sea level is rising and it's gonna be rising at an increasing rate. And so let's just assume that we grab this area and we somehow magically made it a, a cool wetland. It's not going to be wetland for a whole lot longer, right? It's going to be subtitle. So simply using the old geographic delineation of where X should be and where Y should be, at least in the coastal zone, that maybe ain't going to work too well, right? Or at least it'll work for a few decades, but it's not going to work a whole lot uh, longer past that. In some cases, that might be enough. If we have an endangered bird that needs to lay her eggs now, she can't wait 50 years, so maybe that's worth doing in that case, right? Understanding that maybe it's not going to be here in 30 years. But, but in general, though, if we're trying to restore something for you know, hundreds of years, that old historic map maybe isn't the best thing to use. We could talk about restoring focal species. So we can restore landscapes. We can restore seascapes. We can also restore just single populations. That falls under the purview of restoration ecology, too. So in this case, this is this very sad, tragic image. Um, this is a famous image um, that Brent took of uh, these gorillas in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And what's basically going on here is that uh, tool there, that guy up on the right-hand side that, that is dressed in a business suit to try to look very like he's a re rational guy, is um, a warlord is the term for that guy. Um, and uh, one of the things these guys have done is they've gone into the protected area that, pr that protected these gorillas and uh, started using that to make money. 
and started using that to make money, one, to just make money off the tourists uh, and take over that trade. But then also, what you see on the right-hand side here is a, a train of human traffickers that are moving wood and charcoal out of this protected forest area. They're chopping down the forest, burning the, the um, wood and turning it into charcoal, and then taking that charcoal and selling it in refugee camps where people are desperate for heat and, and, and fuel to cook with and all that kind of good stuff. And, uh, and most of these folks are incredibly poor, and they don't really necessarily want to do this, but they don't have any choice. So the idea is um, this is bad stuff. When the rangers, which are not paid very well, if at all, basically no support, they're doing it because they think it's the right thing to do. When they went and intercepted some of these, um, try, try to stop some of these things, the, uh, the, this warlord understood that these guys are really about trying to save these gorillas. So they just went out and they offed a bunch of gorillas, right? These endangered species, just shot them in the head, cut off their hands, did all this kind of stuff. So, um, this both illustrates the world in which we live in that we're trying to engage in conservation and restoration activities but but we can use restoration to restore these things but uh, to restore species but um, there are all kinds of other constraints that we have on us and and a lot of times the stuff that works say here in the united states it's a very different world in the rest of the planet and uh, simply taking our techniques there won't necessarily uh, work you guys mentioned this notion of removing folk, removing invasive species. Here's an example of that. In this case, we're talking about San Francisco Bay. In this case, we're talking about an, uh, an in the rare hybrid that does really well. Typically, when you guys take our intro bio classes and you listen to all those guys tell you stuff, what you hear is there's species A and species B. And they're good species because if they got together, they, they can't make a baby. Or if they do make a baby, if they do have a hybrid, the hybrid is either not, uh, is un incapable of reproducing, or if it reproduces, it doesn't make as many babies as the parents. So therefore, in an, in an evolutionary sense, it, it can't really contribute. Every once in a while, that doesn't, find, that doesn't happen that way. And this is one of those crazy things. This is a Frankenstein, literally a Frankenstein thing we made by taking one species of Spartina, I mentioned our main uh, most common thing here in Southern California is the salt grass, is pickleweed, excuse me, not salt grass, is pickleweed, Spartina. What used to be called Spartina, the genus has been changing, but we'll call it Spartina. Um, but pickleweed, low prostrate thing. Much of the rest of our country and a lot of the planet, the main dominant herbaceous plant in these uh, estuaries and salt marshes is not that pickleweed, it's cord grass, it's salt grass. And so um, different family of plants. And in this case, Spartina is one of the, the most common uh, species, one of the most dominant g genera. We essentially took one of those guys, shipped it overseas, and put it with others of its other uh, congeners, so other um, individuals that were from the same genus. And they, br they hybridized because they're grasses, so they're, they're, their pollen blows around. Got those. And for whatever reason, magical luck of the draw, these guys are massive, right? So these guys, not only are not only their babies um, pr uh, not producing less seeds, their babies produce way gazillion more orders of magnitude, more propagules, more babies than either of the parent. And they're this incredibly vociferously growing thing. So when the Brits, thank you, that invented, the, that accidentally invented this thing, figured this out, like, this is great. So we'll just start sending it around our empire, right? And so this plant was intentionally spread around because, well, yeah, I'm getting too much. We'll save that for later. But the short version is this sucker gets in and it dominates. Whereas we have Spartina in places like San Francisco. We even have Spartina here in, our, in our Southern California. But it's like a clump, typically. You know, it's like a thing here. It's like a thing there. This stuff goes in and takes over everything and, and obliterates the mud flats and does all kinds of crazy stuff. So it's a critter we're trying to get rid of. And if you look at the picture, let's say, on the left over there, what you see is it actually almost looks like a petri dish you might, from class, maybe like you know, fungal, mold fungal, or, or plates, or, or bacterial plates, where you have this, this nucleus, and everything's growing like a circle away from it, just like a, just like a contamination on an agar plate. 
uh, it's the same thing happening. So in this case, this is from the South Bay Salt Ponds, a large salt marsh restoration in the south part of San Francisco Bay. Um, but we couldn't just allow the water in for a bunch of reasons, one of which was simply, if we just let the water in, all these invasives are going to come in. So we have to actively manage that probably in perpetuity because of these non-native species we're trying to control. We can also use restoration to recover extirpated things. So things not, not just like the gorillas that were harmed or lower, but that actually were completely obliterated, did not exist anymore. And so this is a case from um, these oculina deep sea corals off of the Florida coast in this case. And this is what these things used to look like. So imagine a very muddy, a very, a very, a very uh, uh, non-rocky bottom. And then you have these, these occasional clumps of rock. And on them are all this, is all this coral. And on that coral, all these crabs, all these shrimp, all these fish, super abundant area. That's how it used to be. And then fishermen found this place after World War II and started fishing it and turn it into this. So now most of these places are totally nuked. So now most of these places look like this, rubble. So, so this is coral. You, you're usually used to hearing about these photosynthetic corals that live really in the tropics, really close to the shallow water, really close to the sunlight, because they have uh, zooxanthellae, commensal zooxanthellae, that, that they're you know, photosynthesizing and leaking sugars and giving energy to the coral through that, those sugars. These guys are deep, so they, they don't have photosynthetic guys. They're just down deep, and they're filter feeding. Um, this is the remnant. So the remnant, now, now we've destroyed not just the critter, but in this case, we've destroyed the foundational structural element of the community there. Sometimes people call these types of critters, in this case, this oculina coral, as so-called ecosystem engineers because, because they, they, they change the very nature of how water moves or critters move around. Uh, you can also call them keystone species. Um, giant kelp would, be, would play that role off our reefs here off of, uh, in Southern California. So now everything's nuked, so what are you going to do? Well, so they, they, they finally got that stressor away. We talked about, right? First, is there a problem? Two, let's, let's get that stressor gone. So, oh my gosh, these guys figure out there's a problem. Huh, let's start some protected areas or exclude this fishing practice from around here so we're, we're, we're ceasing to break this stuff up. Great, but now we're on to restoration. Now what do we do? Uh, I don't know. Maybe let's just stop fishing. Does that work? Long story short, no, it doesn't work. It doesn't do crap, right? Why? Check it out. There's all this finger of coral floating around, or not floating, but, but sitting there, right? So if you're a little baby planula, if you're a little baby uh, coral larva, and you come and you poop, you land on one of those fingers of coral, you're good to go. You're like, awesome. Starting to grow, it's all good. And then the first wave comes around, right? And your piece of coral tumbles. Now all of a sudden, wonk, you're squished into the bottom and you kind of break your shell and you know, whatever. So this unstable, unconsolidated matrix is not good for babies and things to settle on. So if we just left it, nothing happened, or at least nothing significant happened. So what do we do? We try something, oh, well, okay, well, we'll talk about that when we come to it. But we try putting artificial structures down to try to jumpstart uh, the process by creating things that won't roll and won't rock and won't go apart. But we'll talk about that, I guess, when we get to it. I thought I had another slide here. Um, okay. Um, here we go. Here's an example from Hawaii. Some of you guys uh, might be coming with us to Hawaii in a couple weeks. We're, I'm taking my uh, students from my coastal management class to, to uh, Hawaii. This is uh, Honolulu. This is, um, th this is Diamond Head. We're looking down that big thing there. And uh, what you see here is, in this case, we're, uh, again, we, this, these examples all can go in many different directions, but this might be an example of so-called function ecological function. So in this case, we had a healthy reef. They were pumping out lots and lots of fish, right? That's, that's one of the functions um, that, that we can envision a healthy system doing. Then we put up these, in this case, a protected area. So this is a very low level restoration, right? This, is almost, this would actually qualify as one of those passive restoration things, right? Or almost passive, right? So what have we done? We've literally put up a, an invisible fence in the ocean and said, don't go here. If you're, not if you're a surfer, but if you're an, a, a fisherman. So this is a, a, an area that is either closed year-round or closed for much of the year. 
And then what we've done is we've gone in and we've gone and we've sampled the fish biomass. So how many pounds of fish do we have living on this river after, you know, after the fact, after we've established these things for a few years. And so that's what's being visualized here. So each of the dots is a sampling point. The size of each of the dot is the amount of biomass. And what do you, what's the pattern you guys see when you look at this? Where are the biggest dots? Near the coast. Near the coast, good. And inside the fence. So th this isn't a perfect, ex perfect experiment, but, but yes, you're right. In, into the coast, good. That's where the reefs are. But then check it out. They aren't to the right of Diamond Head. They aren't farther up there past, you know, north of Waikiki. Now, th knowing nothing else, you don't know if it's confounding factors like more sand or something. But long story short, when we looked there before we put up the protected areas, that biomass wasn't this big. So by, in this case, by eliminating that stressor, that might be enough in some cases. Don't necessarily have to do a bunch of crazy, you know, driving trucks around and all that kind of stuff. Depends on the question. But we can use ecological restoration to restore, in this case, uh, fish biomass. Uh, we can also use restoration to connect things. So we had an intact forest. It was fragmented, in this case, by roads. If you guys have had me for cons bio, you've, you've seen this, or Claire probably. Um, I think she uses my slides for this still. Um, but basically, orient you to this graph, road distance on the bottom, distance from the nearest road. So on the left side of the graph, uh, uh, zero. On the right side of the graph, many kilometers away. And then on the uh, y-axis, that's a proportion of land of the lower 48 states in the US. So what that says is, as, uh, as we go up, almost 100% of the land in the U.S. is within, um, you know, what is that? Is it within about five kilometers of a road? That's crazy. Let me say that again. Across the continent of the, where, our, where our country resides, excluding Alaska, um, you're almost never far from a road. And not only are you almost never far from a road, check it out. 50%, like right about here, right? 50%, boom, boom. About 50% of the land, half of the land is about five, within about 500 meters of a road. That's insane. Clearly not every single square inch, but on average, that for across a continent, that is insane. So this notion of using restoration to connect things, wildlife corridors, uh, road crossings, things like that, that falls under the purview of restoration too if the goal is to restore connectivity, to allow these critters to walk between from spot A to spot B. And here's what that looks like here in Ventura County. Some of you guys have done our road, have helped us out in our roadkill, long-term roadkill study. Mm -hmm. But um, that's, a, that's the, um, unfortunately, mom coyote that I used to watch cross the road for a while um, right when we first moved down here to start, help start the university. And then after a couple months, I found her killed, unfortunately, one day when I was driving home and she was pregnant. It was very sad. Um, and that's what motivated this roadkill study we started. But on the left-hand side, what you see is all, and these, these, aren't, these aren't every single small, little, teeny, tiny forest trail, whatever. These are just the major roads. And so that's creed with uh, either five, what is it, 500 or 100 meters from the road. And that's Ventura County, right? So to illustrate that notion of fragmentation, that's not just a U.S. problem, it's the same thing here. If you're, if you're trying to cross the road, that's a, that's a tough proposition. That's a very challenging proposition. And so we can use restoration to address this, or at least potentially use it to address this.